Mr. Wilson. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote. All in favor of approval of that motion indicate by saying aye. Marianne, will you please call the roll call vote? Chair Pereer. Aye. Vice Chair Harris. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Dr. Orgain. Aye. Mr. Strouther. Aye. Ms. Hibbler. Aye. It passes 6 0. Thank you. We'll move on to item number 17. 18, I'm sorry, which is resolution number 2020-143, Winsong, Lot 3, Amended Preliminary Master Development Plan. All right, Dustin Shane, Galton Planning. This is for Winsong, right off of 109. This is going to be the first out parcel developing there, as you can see circled on the screen. It's going to be a 4,700 square foot convenience store with gas pumps. The site uh, looks good. Engineering made some recommend made some uh, some changes to them that they have they have made. Uh, the landscaping plan you see is an alternative plan. They're requesting the exception that they need um, in the PGC zoning district. You're required to have a one medium. Uh, deciduous or ornamental tree per every 500 square feet of site area and that's not counting your buffer yards and your bioretention trees and as you can see that would be quite a challenge to fit um, so the exception they're asking for is just to allow those buffer yard trees to count for that requirement which would um, would make it to where they're meeting all the other requirements so um, they've got a pretty well designed landscape plan here and they've met all the other requirements uh, so we're recommending that be approved um, the architecture is basically in line with with that zoning district they've added some um, some awnings there that add a, a pitched roof appearance they've got mechanical equipment behind the the large parapet uh, one thing we would like to see is a a uh, elevation of the fuel canopy with the mansard roof that that zoning district requires. Um, also, I've, somehow we inadvertently left out the two engineering comments on the resolution. Um, so I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if you want me to read those out um, at yes, this time. Sir. Okay. Um, so the first one is for final approval, provide a copy of TDEC notice of coverage as this site disturbance is over one acre in size. The second comment is for final approval, sign and record a stormwater maintenance agreement for the project. Contact the engineering division for a copy of the stormwater maintenance agreement form. And uh, I can make sure that we get that information on the final resolution. Okay. Um, do we have a representative for the applicant uh, online? We have uh, Philip Neal with Kimley Horn and Associates and Elena Orr with MJM Architects. Okay. Either or both would like to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Philip Neal with Kimley Horn. Uh, we're the civil engineer for the project. And I think Dustin went through the, the comments and how we've addressed them pretty well, uh, but just wanted you to know that we were on the phone and, and ready to answer any questions that you had following that. And we also heard Dustin, the, the other two conditions to put add to the resolution, which we're uh, of course fine with. We also have um, Helena, the, the architect on, on the line and uh, an owner's rep on the line as well, if, if there's any other questions. Okay. Would either of them like to speak before we ask questions? If not, um, then I'll open this to, to a public comment. If there's anyone in the public who would like to speak, uh, please uh, raise your hand electronically and, and we'll call on you. Again, if you are a member of the public and would like to speak on this item, please do so by in raising your hand at the bottom of the screen under the uh, under the, your attendees tab. And Mr. Chairman, we've received no public comments via email or phone calls prior to this meeting. All right. 
Thank you, Josh. If there is no one raising their hand, then um, I will close the public comment and open it to um, questions from members of the commission. Well, I'll just, I'll lead off by saying that this is a lot like the site we just, I mean, this is a lot like the previous item. Uh, you know, the Chick-fil-A store was a really heavily landscaped site, had a lot around the perimeter. This site may not have the interior landscaping needed by PGC, but it's really heavily landscaped around the perimeter. So I, I see no issue with it. I think staff has no issue with it based on what Dustin said. I'd be in favor of uh, making a motion to approve, but let's have some, I, well, I'll put a motion on so we have some discussion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Harris. So discussion on that? No, I'll, I'll agree with you, John. The, uh, I think this, this is a good example of where exceptions to the rules uh, make sense with the uh, landscape requirements for the, for that zoning. So this is, well, going to be a well landscaped project and uh, it's an appropriate place to, to make that exception. I agree. What about the color of the on? Oh, Alana, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, what more quick? Because I'm I know we talked about uh, a few several meetings ago, we talked about the um, the tree bank. I don't know if it's a landscape bank, but since they are heavily already landscaped, is that something that we, we would recommend for like other areas? I'm not sure how that works. We're talking about different, you know, sidewalks, trees, that kind of stuff. It can't be used on your site. Would it be designated to another location that's needed? Well, I don't think we have that in place. Um, I mean, we're working on a tree ordinance, but I don't think we have any ordinance to require that. I think maybe what you're talking about is the sidewalk fund. We talked about where we can, if somebody can't put a sidewalk on a site and the right of way we can request that it be paid into a sidewalk fund and used elsewhere. Right, and I thought, I didn't know if that was the same with the, the trees landscaping type. Mr. Chairman and Ms. Hibbler, we are working to create that ordinance and create the ability for applicants to pay into a tree bank, where whereas the trees that they can't plant on their site, we could then use in uh, open space lots in city parks or as part of stream bank mitigation projects potentially. It is in a very early draft form. It has not been vetted, it has not been adopted. So it is not, we cannot enforce that rule or collect any monies for it yet because it is not uh, canonized in law yet. But it is something that planning staff is working with the beautification committee on. All right, thank you. So what about the color of the awning? Is it um, is that a condition in staff's report? I'm trying very hard to pull up that uh, that staff report as we speak. We've got one condition that we would like to see the mansard roof style, and then also um, these colors here would be toned down uh, in line with what's required in the PGC zone. And that is listed as a condition, correct? We've got a, yeah, we've got a note on the plan here that when they apply for signs that we're going to make sure that uh, everything meets that code. They, they've got some sign um, elevations that are not satisfying code. So we just had, had them put these notes on there saying that they would the final submission. Mr. Chairman, this site is also subject to a master um, uh, pattern book, which provided conceptual illustrations um of a gas station and a gas station canopy and we will review whatever submitted against what's been approved in the pattern book as well all right <clears throat> and i believe the uh, applicant's architect would uh has un elena ms elena or uh mr chairman if you'd like to recognize her she might be able to help uh, the discussion on this issue. Yes, please, Ms. Orr. Go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. So we are only the architect for the building itself, not for the canopy. 
but we understand from the signage vendor that's been working on the, the fueling canopy that they do plan to incorporate a mansard roof. And I believe what the tenant is wanting to do is they're gonna remove the red stripe and propose that it be white, um, I, I believe while still keeping the Exxon text, but removing the rest of the red. So just to put you correctly, the, the only red remaining is the text of Exxon? That's what we've understood from the signage vendor, yes. Well, that's certainly, certainly acceptable. Any other discussion? Anyone? Well, then I believe we have a motion on the, I've, I've made a motion. Did anyone second that motion? Yes, Matt did. I Matt did. did. So we have a motion on the floor and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, then uh, I'll call for the vote. Uh, Marianne, will you please take a roll call vote? All in favor of approval of the motion to uh, the motion to approve with staff's comments. Please indicate by saying aye. Chair Pereer. Aye. Vice Chair Harris. Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Dr. Orgain? Aye. Mr. Strowler? Aye. Ms. Hibbler? Aye. House is 6 0. Thank you. And the next item uh, that we'll discuss is item number 19. That's resolution number 2020 151. It's Vintage Baker's Crossing amended preliminary master development plan. Uh, who's presenting this item? Jillian Ogden, staff planner. Thank you, go ahead, Jillian. The owner and applicant requests approval of an amendment to the Baker's Crossing preliminary master development plan for the vintage Baker's Crossing apartments, totaling 26.13 acres located north of Nashville Pike and west of Tula Poplar Drive. The property is zoned MU, which is mixed use, and multifamily is a permitted use in the MU zone district. As you can see on the slide on your screen, the property is bordered by a railroad, a creek, and a major roadway. Next slide, please. This amendment is only a PMDP, an FMDP would still be required. Next slide, please. The Baker's Crossing Master Plan first began in 2006 when the property re was rezoned to MU. Since then, multiple iterations of apartments have been approved in this area north of Tulip Poplar. The 2006 plan on your screen indicates multifamily in this area, but it was not specific at the time. Um, it just had that area labeled for that future development. Next slide. Plans in 2008 included a 290 multifamily unit complex on 26.95 acres. The apartments were set back in the floodplain and floodway. Two remaining parcels out along Tulip Poplar were labeled as future multifamily development, but no other information is shown for that area. At this time, the max number of apartments permitted per the zoning was 358 units, but only 290 were proposed as shown at that time. Next slide, please. A minor amendment to the master plan in 2011 was approved by Planning Commission for 252 units on 21.56 acres. This amendment did not include those front two parcels. This plan did include a proposed building height of 44 feet, as opposed to the typical 35 feet allowed in MU zoning. Since that time, the Tulip Poplar Drive and, Hilt and Hilton Garden Inn have both been constructed and the Comfort Inn has begun construction. For reference, these developments are also part of Baker's Crossing and um, following multiple amendments and FMDPs over the last uh, 14 or so years. Next slide, please. This was the architecture that was submitted in 2011 for reference. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. This amendment will shift the location of the proposed apartment complex 
toward Tulip Poplar Drive and away from Big Station Camp Creek in the floodway floodplain. The applicant proposes a 264 multifamily unit complex with 11 apartment buildings with a clubhouse and other amenities on the 26.13 acre site. Next slide, please. The landscaping and parking are consistent with the zoning code. The architecture at this time, next slide, please. The architecture is conceptual at this time, but the plans indicate that the 70% brick stone requirement will be met as it has been indicated in several iterate, previous iterations as well. The applicant has also included the 44 foot uh, building height approved with the previous PMDP in this plan. The greenway as shown on the Gallatin on the Move comprehensive plan also runs through this development. If you'd go back one slide, please. And one more slide. The Planning Commission will need to determine if the proposed amendment is a minor or a major amendment. The Planning Commission should consider the development's history in determining if this amendment should be considered a major or minor. A major amendment would require City Council review and approval of the amended PMDP. Staff recommends approval of the amended PMDP. This item does include a public comment and the applicant is in attendance with any, with any questions. Thank you. Thank you. If we have a representative for the applicant present, uh, please um, go ahead. We do. We have uh, Mr. Greg Harris. Greg, your line has been unmuted. Yeah, good evening. Uh, this is Greg Harris with uh, Enfield Group. We're the civil engineers for the project. We're also joined tonight by uh, Ross Bradley with TDK, builder developer his co-developer, Greg Summerlin, and our architect, Gina Emanuel, with Centric Architecture. So if you have anything specifically for them, they're available. Um, Jillian did a great job of explaining the history and, and our project. One thing that I, I would like to, I guess, stress is um, with moving the project forward towards Tulip Grove, um, there's no disturbance of the floodway as previous plans uh, had done. So uh, we feel really positive that we have uh, have an improvement here over what had been approved in the, uh, in the past. All right, thank you, Mr. Harris. Um, this item has a public comment uh, or comes with public comment. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak in regards to this item. If so, please indicate by raising your hand electronically. Again, if you are a member of the public and would like to speak on this issue, please do so by raising your hand at the bottom of the screen under your user tab. Mr. Chairman, we have received uh, no emails or phone calls about this for any public comment for this project. And at this time, this will be the last call. If you're a member of the public and would like to speak on this issue, please indicate so by raising your hand at the bottom of the screen. Mr. Chairman, no one has indicated that they would like to speak on this item. All right, thank you. Um, at this time, we need to determine if it's a major or a minor amendment. Um, so, a major amendment uh, uh, is determined by a change in circulation, change in architecture, increase in density, um, trying to remember what the other litmus tests for major major versus minor are. In essence, it's whether it's a big deal or a small deal and whether it needs to go to city council or not. Uh, so we need some discussion on whether it is a major or minor amendment. Yeah, I, I guess my comments on the major or minor amendment would be, I think the, and correct me if I'm wrong, staff, the, the number of units in this is being decreased, is that correct? from the previously approved plan? So from initial approvals, um, the one in 2008, it was 290. 
in 2011, it went down to 252, so it decreased, and now it's going to uh, 264. Um, so it's right there in the middle. Um, they have moved this up towards the road, so there's more. It's it's kind of confusing because if you could go back two slides, please. I keep going to the 2008 plan. One more. Matt, while she's finding that, I'll tell you that it's a decrease in density, but it's an increase in the number of units. Correct. Um, this, this front part along Tulip Poplar, where the apartments did not sit before, they're, they're moving them up. So I think initially there was potential for there even being more units, but initially it was just approved. They were proposed 290 went down to 252 in 2011, and now it's 264, although it is including that front area. So um, it's, it's kind of in the middle there. It's better than what it, what it was and could have been, but I mean, we're 12 units more than the previous approval, so we're not. Correct. Sure. I mean, circulation, I mean, you know, it doesn't seem a big deal. The, the architecture part of it, while the architecture's different it's I think it's an improvement but it's not drastically different than the previous approval just looking at the slides so it is behind my comments I don't I could be inclined to call it a minor amendment um, I just want to point out the, the latest the latest plan that was approved was 2011 plan with 252 units which superseded the earlier considered plan so they reduced it down to 252. I believe it is on the same geography, uh, meaning that it envelops the same portion of the property of the master plan that it previously did. So increasing it from 252 up to 264 could be considered an increase in density if that's the way that y'all want to handle that. Uh, so yeah, this one here is the, help, have, this is the 2011 plan. Yes. Yeah. And keep in mind that you see that arc of that follows along the northwest side of um, Tula Poplar Drive. That did not include a future phase for multifamily residential at that time. So, but the original plan did. It called it, uh, you remember Julian had mentioned. Yeah, up there. it just said, um, it said uh, future multifamily development in the 2008 version. So the 2008 version had a, a drawing that showed 290 units and then had that arc of area showing up to, to make it up to 358 units. And then that plan was approved and that was active between 2008 and 2011 when this new plan came in, removed that arc from phase two, and I guess they were going to assign it to other uses that would be permitted in the MU zoning district. It was unclear, I believe. Yes, um, it just said, let me see if I can see what it actually said. It said future multifamily development, but it did not give any other details, nor did it list any unit counts for that front arc area. Um, so it was still very vague even at that stage, and it wasn't included in that amendment. It was just left as is. So that's that tract, also that tract 1A up above there to the north, I guess we call it the northeast part of the, the development site that's currently proposed. So it's it would be up to the Planning Commission to determine whether or not they think an increase from 252, which is the currently approved multifamily units on this same property, up to 264 is uh, an increase, keeping in mind that the arc is not included. Uh, this area that I showed, or they showed as being the arc was not included in the 2011 plan, except for future residential. We don't know uh, how many units that actually would be. Thank you, Bill. I'll just weigh in and say, look, this, this property is zoned to allow apartments. They have every right to build apartments. But I think as hot a topic as um, growth and, um, you know, high density growth is that I think council would want to see this. Um, my understanding of major versus minor is whether Council needs to be involved or if they just want us to handle it because it's a minor issue. 
Maybe that's not the correct definition of major versus minor, but that's how I interpret it. Um, and I feel like council needs to be aware of this and being aware is by it being sent to them and let them see it. Make and a motion. Uh, well, we have a motion. Actually, a motion has been made on the floor by Mr. Harris to um, make it a minor amendment. So um, I should have asked for a second before I made my comments. I'm sorry. Um, so Mr. Harris has a motion on the floor for it to be a minor amendment. Do I hear a second to that motion? Man, I don't know how long, with, in, in person I would look around the room. I can't really look around the room, but if I don't hear a second, I'll have to uh, I'll make, motion. I'll make it easy, I withdraw my motion. Okay, um, so do I hear a motion from someone uh, for the alternative? Do I hear a motion for it to be a major amendment? I'll make a motion that it be a uh, major amendment and pass forward. Okay, we have a I'll motion Sibler, and we have a second by Albert. I believe I heard Albert there. So discussion on that? I just think that it should be considered a friendly motion, as you said, to have the city council um, discuss it because they're the ones voted into office. I, I agree, Dr. Gain. And and quite honestly, as Matt pointed out, the architecture, the, the architectural changes that they made are, I think, for the better. Um, you know it's going to go apartments, but I think council would be miffed with us if this were approved without them getting to uh, to weigh in on it. So, uh, Mr. So Chairman, have, this is sir. this is Josh King. In order to make this a major uh, major amendment, the planning commission would need to find it meets one of eight uh, clearly outlined major amendments to refer it to the city council. The first one is an increase in density. Sub uh, second one, substantial changes in circulation. Third one is substantial changes in the mix of dwelling units. Four is grading. Five is mix of land uses. Six is reduction in open space, landscaping, and buffer yards. Seven is substantial changes to architecture, site design features. Uh, eight is or any other change that the city planner determines to be a major divergence from the PMDP. So for planning commission to refer this to city council, uh, can I ask that the motion be clarified which one of these very specific triggers is uh, what is sending this item to city council? All right, I, I appreciate that. Uh, we'll make it on uh, F7, which is substantial change in architecture, and also on the anything else the city planner has deemed to be a significant change. And the city planner has pointed out to us that although it was technically a decrease in density, it's increasing the density. So I feel like that's a valid reason to send it to council. And the, also the site, the the moving it up, moving it away from the uh, original area. Flood zone for the that as well. Don't know if that falls under one of those specific. Um, uh, I, th uh, I thought it would be the grading and utility provisions, if if that's what you wanted to do. Uh, did he did? Sorry, did he say change in architecture and site or slash site? Yes, it's they're both included under. Item seven, which is substantial changes in architecture or site does site design features of the development. Okay. So the maker of the motion, we have the maker of the motion is Ms. Hibbler, seconded by Wilson, can make uh, amendment to their motion, or the group, somebody else can uh, request an amendment to that motion. I'll I'll amend it to include those two. Okay, that's easier. And Josh, this is uh, Gina Emanuel. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask a question on this motion or not. Ms. Emanuel, I'm sorry, who are you with? I'm, I'm um, the architect on this project and uh, I was a couple minutes late, I apologize, but I was um, trying to understand what the change of architecture um, motion meant as you all are sending it forward. 
Mr. Perrier, I can uh, I can explain. Uh, Ms. Emanuel, substantial changes to architecture is one of the triggers we have that would send this that could potentially send this amendment to City Council for a vote. Uh, it's one of one of eight items that's outlined in our zoning ordinance. Right now, the Planning Commission is uh, looking at item number seven, but more on the site design features. We have not discussed the change in architecture from what was approved to what's being proposed at this time. But the deliberations continue. Thank you. Question for hey, Josh, the for the condition for changes in architecture, can you read that again, what the, how the condition reads? Sure. Uh, it says, number seven, substantial changes in architectural or site design features of the development. Okay. Well, just to send a clear, um, Alana amended her motion to include um, those two right there. Is that correct? The architecture? And the site, yes, sir. Both of them. Right, great. Mm -hmm. Then to, make, to give a clear message to council as to why we're sending it, I would like to make an amendment. I would propose an amendment, and that is that it's also on the basis of the very last one on the litmus test, which is anything else the city planner deems to be a significant change. And the city planner has pointed out to us that although it's a decrease in density, when you look at the square footage, it is an increase in the number of units. Am I quoting the city planner correctly that that was the concern? Well, that would be handled under item number one, an increase in density of the development from what was most recently approved. So it w I, I wouldn't need to add condition number eight. If there was some other provision that was not listed there that I thought was important, I would. Now, one thing I will warn you about is that in the presentation tonight, and I don't believe in your agenda package, correct me if I'm wrong, that you viewed the architecture of the previously approved plan. So what we saw is the site plan, the layout of it, but we didn't see the actual architecture of it. The architecture from 2008 was in their packets. It was in their packet, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's on the, on the slides. Okay, so the architecture from 2008 was on the slide and in your packet, but the 2011 one, which was- Or, a, was or I apologize, 2011. I didn't okay. have the architecture for 2008. Okay, so I mean, if, okay, there we go with the, uh, that's the current one, right? Yes. Oh, that's the 2011 one. Yes. Okay. So you'd have to make the finding that the architecture there uh, is substantially different than the one that's proposed with the new plan. And that could be a finding that would elevate it to the council in addition to item one. So as I understand, based on the amended motion, <clears throat> And the reasons listed under subsection 150730F, there are eight conditions, and you only have to meet one to elevate it to a major amendment. And y'all have identified condition number one, which is density, condition number four, which is substantial changes to grading or utility provisions, and uh, condition number seven, which is architectural changes to architectural site design features of the site. Yes, sir. Hmm? Mr. Of... Chairman. Yes, this go is, ahead. This is, this is Greg Harris again. Just one thing uh, to point out, the, the actual units per acre density for the 2011 plan was 11.68. Ours is 10.10. So if you're just looking at units per acre, our density is less, even though the number of units is greater. So not the number one on the list, um, it, it does say density, so I just wanted to point that out. Mr. Harris, no, I think everyone, un I, I believe everyone understands that, that uh, the issue is that the number of units has gone up and council simply needs to be aware of it and lay eyes on it. Well, 
the, the quality or the types of plans that were previously approved were not very clearly stated on the drawings. We are talking about the same geography here than as the previously approved plan. Why the acreage is different, I'm not sure. We did mention that the dif differences or the inconsistencies in the staff report and reported on that. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, that wedge area that was adjacent to the arc of Tulip Poplar back a certain distance showed that area that uh, was for future development, but it didn't indicate what that might be other than it's that track one there and the area south of the track 1A, uh, tr track 1A south of that area. So I don't know what track 1A was to be identified for there. Uh, and, and the other part doesn't even seem to be indicated as part of the master plan. So the, 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 the materials that were provided previously are very sketchy at best. This, there's been a lot of irregularities about uh, everything from platting to master plans over the years on this property, which uh, hopefully will clear up at this time. Mr. McCord, that the area that you mentioned in the northwest corner, kind of along Tula Poplar, that area is now included in this plan, and so that's why the the difference in the area um, that was in, is included in this plan and not as future development. So that's how the density went down. We increased the land area. Right, Mr. Pereer, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Please. Are, are we in the are, are we in the middle of, of debate on a motion made with the applicants participating now? Well, I yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I appreciate that, Mister. Yeah, just you know, I mean, I, it, it's a little easier when we're all in the same room to to have the clarity. But my, you know, I I my only. My point of this being a, a minor amendment is, and I'll make it a little bit clear, is it's, this is a site approved for apartments. There's no question it's going to get approved for apartments. This is a better plan than has been there. The change in density is insignificant. And so, you know, councils over the years approved different variations of similar size and shape buildings for, golly, I mean, a decade on this property. So just doesn't make any sense to me why we would, you know, send it back to them for such a minor change. But that's just my opinion and I'll, I'll leave it alone. I want to make sure that the motion, Ms. Ms. Hibbler, um, we've had so much discussion. We've had amendments to the motion. Will you please restate your uh, motion? Uh, make a motion. No, not make a motion. Will you just restate the motion that you made, or I can have Marianne call it back, either one. Marion, would you mind calling it back? Sure. Uh, Ms. Hibbler made a motion to uh, make this a major amendment because of the um, architectural change and the site change. Okay. Then, yes, in order to send it to council, um, the real basis that we're sending it to council, I need to make a motion to make an amendment to Ms. Hibbler's motion. And that is that it's also on the basis of item one, an increase in density. Correct. Do I hear a second to that? Second. Second by Ms. Hibbler. All in favor of that amendment to her motion? <laughs> or I'm sorry, discussion on that. The, make, the maker of the motion will need to make the amendment. So okay. So I need to make to make the amendment to add number one, and then John could second that. Okay. Or um, or the seconder of the amendment of the original motion, Mr. Wilson could make the motion to amend it. Oh, okay. And then you could be the second. I mean, I make the I, I would like to amend my motion to include number one in addition to what has already been stated. Okay, and I will second that. Uh, any discussion on that amendment to her original motion? Um, 
Seeing none, then Marianne, will you take a roll call vote on the approval of the amendment to the motion? Chair Pereira. Aye. Vice Chair Harris. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Dr. Orgain. Aye. Mr. Strouther. Aye. Ms. Hibbler. Aye. That passes 6 0. Thank you. And now, if we can take a vote on the uh, motion as amended. I know this is a lot of procedure, but I'm trying to do it correctly. So the motion as amended is to, send, to uh, make it a major amendment uh, based on the um, section one, which is increase in density, as well as section seven, which is change in architecture and um, site grading. So this is all to give it a major amendment. Um, indicate by saying aye. Marianne, please call the roll. Chair Pereer. Aye. Vice Chair Harris. No. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ah. Dr. Orgain. Ah. Mr. Strouther. Ah. Ms. Hibbler. Ah. Passes uh, five to one. So now we've made it a major amendment. We've had public comment. We've heard from the applicant. As far as the item itself, the um, amended preliminary master development plan, uh, I'll entertain a motion uh, regarding our recommendation to council. I, for one, will recommend approval. I think y'all did. did we? I think that last motion was yeah, the motion to. No, it wasn't. We did two no, votes. We did one. Mr. Pereira, we did two votes. We did one on the major amendment, and then we did one on approval, approving the. No, there it was one on changing, like amending her motion, and then they did the major amendment vote. Jillian is I'm correct. Sorry, say that again, please. Okay. So the first one was amending the motion, which was six zero, and then the second Wait, one sorry. was deciding it was a major, which was five one. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is where it does come to a crawl on Zoom, uh, uh, right. but it's necessary. Um, so now yeah. we need to um, vote on a recommendation to council. I have a, before we go down, can I ask a question of uh, the engineering department? Certainly. Uh, for, for Nick, this was. This was, uh, you know, talking about this project at, at work session and going back to our last meeting, this is the Tula Papa Road where Planning Commission voted to make a demand on the surety to complete the Tula Papa Road. And there was some discussion at our work session regarding, I think, this project and, and kind of giving them an opportunity to maybe come up with some solution to get that road finished. Um, but before we recommend this project get approved, I'd like to know where we stand on the road improvements. Uh, this is Nick Tuttle, the City of Gallatin City Engineering Division. And uh, yes, Mr. Harris, uh, actually, we've been talking with uh, both the developer um, of Baker's Crossing and Home Depot over the past uh, few weeks. And uh, they would both like to speak with you all tonight. Um, and so um, I, and I don't mind kind of filling you in. There should be actually some folks on the line. Um, for to speak on on both of those developments, but um, just a, a quick run through of, of what um, the folks for Baker's Crossing in this section of Tula Poplar Drive, um, as I understand it, they would like to to actually um, finish this um, road construction within about three or four weeks um, of this meeting. Um, they've they've scheduled a meeting with our inspector uh, to make repairs on on this the street, uh, and um, and they're they're hoping to move forward with it. And I believe that they're be asking you um, here towards the end of the meeting um, if you'll allow them just a few more weeks. No. Oh. Okay. So the 
the owner of the letter of credit is not the developer that you have been discussing uh, this project with um, during this time. All right. All right. I'm, I, I, I'm aware of that. I think the, my, my concern is we made a demand on the letter of credit to get this finished and then held up on following through on that while, you know, hoping to work something out with this specific project. So I'm hesitant to move this project forward, you know, with the issue of the road still unresolved. Well, it, if you if you all um, want to hold um, hold tight to um, the original um, demand a few weeks ago, I'm happy to, to follow through with that. Um, I feel like we finally um, got them looking at this, and and um, they're interested in making this happen. And as I understand, they want to do this within the next few weeks. Um, I, I don't mind waiting a few more weeks. Um, but I also don't mind going ahead and, and getting our folks out there to take care of this uh, either. Actually, we have uh, Rogers Group on contract uh, to be able to take care of this. So, oh, it, either way works for me. Um, I just know they, they they actually seem intent on on doing this within the next few weeks. So that's why I wanted to give them an opportunity to at least speak to you. Okay. Well, I I. I, yeah, I think I think we need to hear from them. I it seems like every time we have a conversation about calling surety on a on a project, the all of a sudden the, the developers you know pop up and are all of a sudden willing to to finish and take care of it. And so, um, it seems like every time we do, we back off of it for some reason, and then wind up with problems after we give more grace after years and years of waiting. So, Mr. Uh, Harrison, Mr. Tuttle, uh, with the chairman's permission, can we add this to? Uh, item 22 under other business. I, I'm fine with that if John and if Mr. Pereira is. Sure, absolutely. So, with with that, I'll I'll, I'll make a motion on on the uh, on the Vintage Bakers Crossing to to approve the project with. We recommend approval of the project with staff's conditions. But adding a condition that the project not start until the Tulip Poplar Road is uh, resolved. Do we have Do we have a second to Mr. Harris's motion? I'll second. Second by Dr. Organ. Uh, any discussion on that or questions? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mary Ann, will you take a roll call vote? Mr. Chair, <laughs> Mr. Chair I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I want to make you aware that this is a PMDP amendment and not an FMDP. So there's no, uh, necessarily, there's no basis for them to move forward rapidly to construct the road since it's not tied to an FMDP. So the, an FMDP would still, if this project is approved, an FMDP would still have to come in. That's gonna take a little while to have that happen. <clears throat> so the, as I understand your motion was to um, recommend with staff conditions and <clears throat> not allow the project to begin until two the Poplar Drive improvements are completed. So <clears throat> there's nothing that, if there's no urgency like there is in calling the surety for Tulip Poplar Drive. And I, Mr. McCord, I, I understand that. We've already called the surety for Tulip Poplar Road. So I, my, my feeling is that's gonna get resolved very quickly, but we're, we're having a debate about Tulip Poplar Road after we've already made a decision on it based on. Right. Matt, I don't think we've called the surety. Nick. Yes, yes we did. We know the planning commission voted to call the surety, but, is, but it hasn't been done is my understanding. My we called it for Home Depot portion. No, we we made we in our last meeting we we voted for the city of Gallatin to, to make a demand on the surety for the rest of that road. Mr. Harris, I think there was a there was a demand a resolution at the last mm -hmm. meeting, uh, but then during that meeting, I think um, there was some request by Mr. Tuttle to say hold off on that one. I think if I remember correctly. 
Um, there was discussion at the work about holding off on it. Um, hey, Mr. You're correct. This is new. I'm sorry, Mr. Bunnell. I just wanted to, I think I can clarify this. Um, the Planning Commission did make, um, the, did pass resolution called both I don't know if I can. Home run. Depot surety and security. No. I don't, could you hear me? I'm sorry, I got a little bit of feedback from someone else. Yeah, it's, it's, it's breaking up. I think Nick, just if I, to clarify that, you're, you're saying we, the Planning Commission did pass a resolution to make a demand on the surety for the remainder on both the Home Depot and the, the other part of it. Yes, sir, that's correct. Um, now, we, we actually sent a letter um, for Home Depot and uh, they, of course, also contacted us and, and they would like to um, discuss this tonight as well. Um, so we had our, uh, their lender there, the, um, the surety holder, Home Depot, um, would also like to discuss the issue um, and um, I just got in touch with them or they got in touch with me and spoke with me about this. Um, I think it was Monday last week. Um, we ended up talking a little bit more into Friday. To, so we would like to discuss uh, their item under, under other business as well. Hey, Matt, can you hear me? Yeah, there you are, Sean. You, so you can hear me. I, I, I apologize, guys. I've been out on the campaign trail and and been covered up i'm just catching uh you know pretty much walking in blind on this i, I know you're talking about the surety now but are we talking about the apartments also the proposal of those yes sir that's correct we are it, is there some hiccups with the apartments or are they already a sure thing um Council Fennell, uh, for the record, we chose to make it a major amendment to send it to council. Um, they've made, uh, and we have a motion on the floor right now. Well, actually, Marianne, help me out. Do we have a motion on the floor and a second to um, recommend approval? Uh, let's see, yes. Um, but it has Mr. Harris a made a motion to recommend approval with the added condition that the road be finished before this project starts. Are you, are you talking about approval of the apartments, Chairman, per year? Yes. Yes. You, but, but there's no major that has to be sent up. Or is it was it voted as a minor to be hand all this to be handled in planning, or was it was there a, a major discussed as far as sending it up to the council? It's a major. So it will be sent to council. It's a major to be sent to council. Okay, so we could we could kill these apartments. Is what I'm saying. What I'm asking you, if it goes up to the level of the council, correct? Um, they have they have vested right. They have a right to apartments in that planning zoning. In that okay, planning zone. yeah, I understand that. But what is this major? or minor amendment for? The, uh, ma it was a major amendment because um, although it is, they are technically correct, it is a decrease in density. So they added more land to it. It does increase the number of units, not significantly, but it does increase the unit number of units by I believe 15? 12. Units. 12 units, okay. Um, is, there, so, is, there, is there any way, because I do not support apartments at all, is there any way that I can kill these apartments? Um, <clears throat> that would be up to council to decide. It, uh, um, but we just we wanted to make sure the council is aware because of, um, because it is apartments. We just wanted council to be to have the decision on this. And to clarify, just to clarify, maybe for Sean, if 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 this particular plan was voted down by council they would they do still have an active plan where they could build a previously approved plan couldn't they that is correct yeah so so essentially sean it's 
they already have a, 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 a plan for apartments on this property that's approved. So if this one gets voted down, they could simply choose to build the other one. That would be 12 fewer units, however, not as desirable of a site plan. And quite frankly, the buildings in the new plan are much more attractive. So my, my thing is been sitting out for 10 or 11 days solid out there at the poles having 1,500 to 2,000 people coming by you every single day, they do not want any more apartments in Gallatin. I am totally against them. So we have a motion on the floor and it has a second. Uh, the question for Bill is, um, Bill, are you stating that because this is a BMD, that motion is invalid because we can't tie the road construction to a PMDP. Well, I'm just saying that you, you, the intent of the calling the surety is to have the roadway constructed soon. And there's no guarantee that the apartments will be constructed soon as was part of the motion. Well, this, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that the, the motion that I made eliminates the, the demand on the surety that's already been made by the commission. So I think we're going to revisit that later. I just, you know, I, my, my, my intention of that motion is just to have it on the record that, you know, before this site gets finished out, that road's got to be done. You know, I don't, I don't want to see this drug on to where, you know, apart, you know, we, we get, we get this, this project approved down the road and then, Three years from now, we're back here still talking about a road that's not finished. So that, that's all. It's it's a the the motion the minute to the motion has no it has no teeth in essence unless they were going to try to build this next year or you know next month. So I, I understand what Matt's saying. Yeah. Well, so, to remove so confusion, I wouldn't add a condition related to constructing the road before the PMDP. Okay, fine. Who who did Mr. Wilson make uh, make the second on my motion? I think I did. Oh, sorry. Dr. Dane did. Would you, would you, would you consider removing, would, would, is it better to, to amend the motion or to, to make a new motion altogether? I'll withdraw my second if you want to make a new motion. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll withdraw my motion and just make a motion to approve with staff's comments. Do we hear a second? I second. Okay. All right. Any further discussion on that? We have a motion to approve with staff's comments. I just want to mention to Councilman Fennell that his predecessors, predecessors were the ones that set this up. Uh, that's not anybody's fault. That was probably 20 years ago. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Dr. Orgain. Uh, it, it's hard to uh, relate that to some of the, some of the public be honest with you, but I'm trying my best. Things have changed dramatically in the last 20 years for all of us. Oh yeah. Believe me, I know. I'm glad you were voted in and not me, you know, tell the mayor to get rid of me. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Orgay. So we have a motion on the floor with a second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Mary Ann, will you take a roll call vote? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Chair Pereer. Aye. Mr. Harris. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Uh, Counts uh, Dr. Orgain. Aye. Councilman Fennell. No. Mr. Strather. Aye. Ms. Hibbler. Aye. Okay, it passes, um, well, let's see, it passes 6-0. Thank you. Uh, we'll move Fennell on. Voted no. I voted six. no. Six to one. Six I'm sorry, one. six to one. I'm sorry, six to one, yes. Uh, thank you. We'll move on to the uh, item number 20, which is Toyota of Gallatin. It's uh, resolution number 2020-153, Toyota of Gallatin, amended preliminary master development plan and final master development plan. This one will come with a public, include a public comment as well. Uh, which staff members handling this item? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Josh King with the, the City of Gallatin Planning Department. Uh, this revised PMDP slash FMDP, FMDP is for the current Toyota of Gallatin dealership. Next slide, please, Dustin. This 
the applicant is proposing a um, changes to the site and modifying the building in a total of two phases. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is the landscaping. They are asking for an amended buffer yard to uh, the boundaries on either the, uh, I'd say that's the northeast and southwest corner, so the upper and lower boundary lines between uh, this and the Newton Nissan dealership and this site and the commercial lots that front Grassland Drive. Next slide, please, Dustin. So uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is the phase one building changes. In phase one, they anticipate adding service base to the back of the building and drive through quick service, uh, pick up drop off lanes to um, the side of the building. And if you'll keep your eye on the star, you can with phase two, Dustin, please. Next slide. You can see the additions planned for phase two, which involve bringing the building further back from Nashville Pike uh, with a new showroom office, wash dry bays, and a parts addition. So the star is the center part of the building that's to remain from the original uh, in both phase one and phase two. And this is gonna be important for, next slide please, Dustin. The applicant is asking for uh, an architecture alternative, both for the front of the building, which is proposed to be uh, metallic, uh, metallic panels, and the sides of the building, which are either going to be the existing split face concrete block, uh, which is existing on the building now, or using uh, vertical metal panels. And so staff is actually recommending approval of the alternative architecture for this plan. This site has a very limited uh, visibility from the right of way of either Grassland or from Nashville Pike. The front of the building um, is similar to what you would see most other uh, recent Toyota dealership updates look like with the CMU panels, uh, I'm sorry, with the metal panels and with the illuminated, illuminated glass entryway. Uh, so for this site, there's a total of uh, two things the council has to consider with the amended buffer yards and the alternative architecture. Staff is recommending approval on both of those items as contained in, this, in the staff report. And I believe we have, uh, if you are with the applicant, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you now. Uh, and if I haven't unmuted you, if you could raise your hand and we will call on you accordingly. So staff recommends approval of the overall uh, revised FMDP, PMDP, and approval of both the amended buffer yards and the alternative architecture. All right, do we have a representative for the applicant online? Yes, this is Matt Sewell with Sewell School Architects. I'm the architect on the project. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Sewell. Well, I'd just add on to what Josh is saying. Not only, you know, with the phase two proposed showroom, we are pulling this back, as he mentioned, but also this building gets considerably wider. So the view from Nashville Pike and blocking those service and quick loop areas um, improves even greater because that showroom comes so much wider uh, at the front of the building. And obviously this, you know, the, the, the request for it is um, because of the cost of split face CMU versus the metal panel, um, you know, the, the owner wants to obviously get to phase two and, and saving the cost on phase one with the metal panels helps uh, with the budget for phase two. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll open this to a public comment. Uh, Josh, do we have anyone from the public who has 
electronically raise their hand to speak about this issue. If you are a member of the public and would like to speak on this item before the Planning Commission tonight, please indicate so by raising your hand electronically at the bottom of the screen. And Mr. Chairman, while we wait on anyone that would like to speak, we have received no emails or phone calls uh, regard for public comment for this project. And again, last call, if you're a member of the public and would like to speak on this item, please indicate so by raising your hand electronically at the bottom of the screen. Mr. Chairman, no one has indicated they'd like to speak. All right, at this time I'll close the public comment. Um, hey, I just wanted to, I know, I know it's late, but I just wanted to ask you real quick. Uh, so what just happened exactly? Um, if yes, your sir. mic is live, can you Sorry, please can mute yourself? What does that mean? Okay. Mr. Chairman, please proceed. Okay. Um, is that, a, I'm sorry, is that a question for public comment on this item or was in the process of closing the public comment? Is there someone who's wishing to speak? Uh, the, the person was Greg Summerlin, who I believe is associated with this project. I just want to give him a chance. If he had a comment, I just want to so, give him a chance. Uh, Mr. Summerlin? Mr. Summerlin. The deal could die, I'm afraid. Um, especially with how Ross seems to react to stuff. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I don't believe Mr. Okay. Uh, Mr. That was, uh, you know, here's the thing about it. We still have. Yeah. I don't think I'll close the public comment now. Um, okay, questions. Um, stormwater. The comment is the stormwater will be treated through a series of underground piping located behind the new structure. Does that mean that they're using, uh, I guess my question is bioretention. Does that satisfy the bioretention requirements uh, for phase two? Or are we only looking at phase one? So this plan does entitle the applicants for both phase one and phase two. They have not submitted a phase stormwater plan to my knowledge, but uh, Nick Tuttle is here and available for questions. Yeah, Josh, I was trying to look back to the and I don't recall seeing, uh, maybe I know the, uh, the, the applicant's engineer is on the line. Um, I remember the discussion um, concerning um, having to deal with water quality treatment um, there in in the phase two area uh, would be uh, on the front end of the lots uh, because they're coming in and doing a lot of extra work um, on the front whereas when the, the project came to us uh, they were really only going to be um, replacing impervious area um, in the back um, and and adding um, items in the back and, and so um, I think it's uh, I think Jason Blakeman was was um, online there or listed as an attendee and maybe can address that as the the engineer. Jason, your line's been unmuted. Dustin, can you go back two slides, please? Uh, maybe one more. Mr. Chairman, I think I may have inadvertently left off the slide that uh, illustrates the stormwater location. Just give me one moment, I'll pull that up. And again, uh, Jason, your line's been unmuted. Oh. 
while we're waiting on uh, Jason to comment, I'll just bounce a question back to Nick. I understand how the pipes are dealing with the water um, quality. Do they not have to address water quantity on this site? That's a question for our engineering department. Uh, sir, they do. Um, fortunately for them, the majority of their site is already impervious. And so it's just at the rear of the property that they're adding more impervious area. So we're just looking for them to offset that increase. Um, and they're actually looking to do underground detention uh, for that ink. Um, and it's in, it's actually behind the building that they're doing that. I, I'm not sure that we have anything on the screen that illustrates that. I'm pulling up the PDA on my side and um, just looking to see if I can direct um, if you have that uh, you'd write to a sheet um, it looks like on C 3.0 not 3PO but uh, 3.0 uh, the site layout at the back of the the property um, it actually covers a, a large portion of the the property across um, a couple of uh, parking bays they are showing um, some lightly hatched an underground detention area um, at the rear. So Mr. Chairman, what uh, Mr. Tuttle's describing should be on the screen right now. It's sheet 3.0 or uh, page 14 of item 20 in your packets. Yes, I'm looking at that page right now. Um, so they're collecting the water under the parking lot with the pipes. and. And now I understand, now that Nick's explained it, I understand that uh, the only thing that they're required to deal with on the stormwater is the change between the current impervious surface and the revised impervious surface. So they're taking that wooded lot out back and turning it into parking lot. And I'm just, my only question is, what are they doing with the water that they collect? Are they reusing it somehow? Or is it dumped into the stormwater, not stormwater system, but well, yeah, into the stormwater system. So they're actually, uh, they're actually just storing it underground uh, and that they do have a use of it uh, and they're not discharging it anywhere. Uh, they, they are, uh, they've done some, uh, some testing of the soil to see if, if they can infiltrate um, underground and that's, they've oversized this detention area underground so that they can handle and accommodate uh, the, the storm water while it, um, perks for for lack of a better word or, or infiltrates the ground okay that satisfies me any other questions from members of the commission seeing none i'll entertain a motion uh, for a recommendation on item number 20. I'll make a motion to approve with uh, staff's comments. All right, we have a motion for approval uh, by Mr. Harris with staff's comments. Second. We have, a second. we have a second by Albert, I believe. Uh, any discussion on that motion in a second? I have one quick question. The, yeah. the stormwater is in the phase two, is that correct? Or is it? Like I was going back and forth. I wasn't hundred percent sure. The stormwater will be built and, and included as any improvements under phase one. The sheet that we're looking at right now, sheet C3.0, indicates that it will be done under phase one. And then sheet 3.1, which is it, phase two, shows it as a pre-existing condition. Okay. Thank you. So um, if there's no other discussion, I'll call for the vote. Marianne, will you please take a roll call vote? All in favor of approval of the motion uh, for uh, indicate by saying aye. Chair Pereer. Aye. Vice Chair Harris. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Councilman Fennell. Councilman Fennell. Dr. Orgay. Aye. Mr. Strouther? Aye. Ms. Hibbler? Aye. Councilman Fennell? Aye. Passes 7-0.
Thank you. Uh, the next item and final item, other than other business, is um, item number 21, resolution number 2020-157, a zoning code amendment uh, by the Gallatin City Planning Department. And this will come with a public comment as well. Um, who's presenting this item? Would that be Bill? Yes, sir. I will be able to present this one. Planning Commissioners, this is a request to amend the zoning code to change the design standards and location standards for fences and walls and hedges and the supplementary district regulations of our code. <clears throat> it affects Article 12, Section 1201. <clears throat> we are amending the code to require that uh, all, chain, all chain link fences that would be erected <clears throat> And this would include not just those that is right now regulated through site plan and master development plan approval, but all chain link fences would be required to be coated with a vinyl material or similar type material. It also uh, uh, would exempt certain public institutions from having and allow them to have barbed wire or it, I guess you could say even razor wire and those institutions would be public institutions like the jail or some other uh, security sensitive area. Uh, it also um, uh, requires, as our current code does now, to have the finished side of the fence. And there are certain types of fences that have a finished side where the panels of the fence face your neighbor and the interior side with the stringers faces the person erecting the fence as property. And this would require, and it reiterates that the finished side of the fence, if someone wants to build a fence in their backyard, other than a chain link fence, of course, <clears throat> would have to face the adjacent property owner. Uh, it also allows for shadow box fences, which those are the t uh, wood plank type fences you're familiar with that are staggered and you can see through at an angle they have a similar uh, finish on both sides with the stringers in between. <clears throat> it uh, also places a change on the height that's allowed in fence um, for fences in certain circumstances. Right now in residential areas, fences are limited to six feet in height. This change would allow for fences of, of uh, up to 10 feet in height in residentially zoned areas, but only in those residentially owned zoned areas where the lot lines abut a commercial zoning or commercial development or industrial development. The thing with the uh, erecting a fence of seven feet uh, greater than or seven feet and greater in height is that um, it requires a structural permit from the building department. And our uh, codes administrator, code department head, will be able to describe the reasons for that. So if someone wanted to build a, a 10 foot tall or an eight foot tall fence in a residential district, they would have to get a structural permit from uh, the uh, building department in addition to meeting these design standards. <clears throat> Same thing goes in commercial areas. They have to get a commercial a structural permit. So this provides some flexibility in the height uh, restrictions that we currently have, but only in those unique circumstances. Um, because of a, a fence that's seven, eight, nine, ten feet tall requires a structural permit, we would not want them to construct that in an easement. So we've added language to the code that would uh, restrict those types of fences and walls from being constructed in an easement. Whereas a fence, let's say six feet or four feet in height, which we commonly see, could be constructed in an easement, but they we can be removed fairly easily. Uh, those fences are also, when they are required to be removed to do maintenance or do some improvements in the easement, that they're done at the owner's cost. So there's a risk that the owner takes by placing a fence in an easement um, that is uh, less than uh, six, six feet in height or six feet or less in height. Whereas uh, we would just not recommend or allow for the construction of a structural fence or wall in, an, in any easement. 
Uh, <clears throat> we would allow for the fence and wall to be placed in a buffer yard, uh, but again, that would not be uh, within an area where there's an easement for utilities. And we're also clarifying that permits are required for all fences. Right now, the building department only requires permits for structural fences. They had requested that we include in the code that all fences be require a permit. Now, planning department does require a permit for plans review to make sure that the fence is compliant with these design standards. So that is the changes that we're recommending on for approval. Uh, that is included in your agenda package, a draft ordinance, which indicates by strike out the language to be removed and underlined by the language uh, to be added. So that would amend, uh, again, Article 12 of the Zoning Code and the Planning Department recommends approval of this uh, draft ordinance. Sorry, I was muted again and trying to mute. Um, at this time, I will open this up to public comment. If there's anyone in the public who would like to speak in regards to this issue, please uh, uh, do so by. Actually, before I get to public comment, I would like a, a comment from a uh, one of our departments. Is Mr. Stewart available? That He shed some light at the work session. Chuck Stewart, are you available to comment? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, I did a little research over the past couple of weeks uh, on, uh, on, on, on fencing. In 2018, the building department of the city of Galton adopted the 2018 building codes, which increased our speed. I'm gonna tell you basically in a line from Alexandria, Louisiana, through Birmingham, over into Texas, everything north of that area increased to 115 mile an hour wind speed with three seconds gust. A fence higher than six feet in height gains 30%. So a, a fence eight feet in height would be nine, almost nine times the wind speed pressure on that fence to keep them flying apart, which requires a whole lot more uh, engineering on that fence. Uh, typically that fence would require fence posts to be uh, buried in a hole that's three inches or 10 inches in diameter, uh, three and a half feet deep. And you couldn't nail that fence up. You have to screw it, put the screws in it. That's why the building code changed from a uh, six foot fence to seven foot uh, once you exceed seven foot, then there's a whole lot of, of issues going to fences at that height that have to uh, help our community from airborne uh, debris. If, if a fence is not constructed uh, by those standards in our wind speed and we get a tornado or a thunderstorm with uh, flat winds. As you know, back in uh, earlier this year, we had a thunderstorm come through Gallum with 85 mile an hour uh, flat wind speed. Those fences are likely to come apart and start uh, putting projectiles out. So that's why the building code changed and it went from six to eight feet. Uh, anything over seven feet requires that permit, which will probably be require an engineer on that project to uh, design that fence and tell you what's available. Uh, I'm gonna progress back to about five or six years ago. Uh, I'd been in this department for a couple of years when a fence came up that was built by the old code and the old code allowed pretty much anything that you wanted to do there. And we had to go to task on one that school buses couldn't see around and had to be removed and back. Uh, our changes at this time since then is stormwater, uh, 
you, you build a fence around your yard, you can't block stone water. So if you're lots of, a falling lot to the rear with drainage in that area, those fences cannot sit, water has to go under them and they can't do that. So fences became a problem uh, for us back at that time. That's why we instituted a, uh, a fence permit. Uh, and we're still a little behind surrounding communities to what we require. Uh, but a fence, that, a solid fence that exceeds uh, six feet in height could cause numerous problems for a building department. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, at this time, I'll open it to a public comment. If there's anyone from the public who would like to speak in regards to this item, uh, please raise your hand electronically and you'll be recognized. Again, as the chairman just said, if you are a member of the public and would like to speak on this item, please indicate so by raising your hand electronically at the bottom of the screen. Mr. Chairman, we do have one phone caller who uh, has not appeared before, so I'm going to unmute uh, the last three of 881. If you're a phone, phone in caller and the last three is 881, your line has been unmuted. Phone caller, last three, 881. If you wanted to unmute yourself, if you have any public comment on this item. Last call for phone number, last three, 881. Mr. Chairman, that is all, that is the only person on the, uh, that is on the call that is not either uh, representing an item um, or otherwise indicated that they'd like to speak. All right. Thank you. With that, I will close the public comment and open it up to questions from the commissioners. Mr. Chairman, this is Sean. Yes. Go ahead, can Captain. I, can I ask uh, Chuck Stewart? Chuck, are you still on? Chuck, are you still on? I am. I presume we're talking about Miss Vivian Huntsman Spence right here, correct? Well, I, I was speaking about any fence that uh, exceeds six feet in height uh, in a uh, area. Normally, uh, if we exceed six feet height in fencing, it's normally uh, in industrial commercial applications, which is chain link fence, which is the, uh, has no uh, bearing about uh, wind speeds. Okay, you made some good points. Uh, so you have not personally went out or none of your crew from the codes has went out and inspected this fence of Miss Huntsman's by any chance? No, we have not. There's not a permit issued and we normally don't go to uh, anything that's not permitted. Okay. Okay, Chuck. Thank you. All right. So I'll leave with a question for staff. I'm rereading this amendment again. Is this only to apply to properties that are adjacent to um, commercial um, properties? These are only for residential properties adjacent to a commercial property. Is that correct? The bulk of this is, but there are other minor changes that involve all properties in the city. Um, again, it affects a bar, well, allows barbed wire fences in institutional zoning districts or institutional uses, I should say. And it also would require, instead of just chain link fences, vinyl coated or similar material chain link fences everywhere. So if you had a, a residential lot somewhere in the city and you wanted to put up a chain link fence, it would have to be uh, coated with the material and it just couldn't be galvanized steel. I want to make that clear. Uh, I'm not sure that's where you want to go with that, but that's kind of how that's written. So for the most part, it, it addresses 
people who want to erect fences in residential zones that are greater than six feet in height, six feet or high, exceeding six feet in height. And that, that's my main question is that they would only be able to exceed six feet in height if they're directly adjacent to a, a commercial property, which by the way, could do the taller fence. Is that correct? That's right, commercial or industrial type prop zoning. Uh, now it also allows for erection of a fence that high if they want to, uh, adjacent to residentially zoned properties, which are developed for multifamily residential. So if you had an apartment complex behind your house and it was zoned residential, multifamily residential, and you had a single family home on your property, you could put up a taller fence adjacent to that residential zone. Uh, I got a question. Go ahead, Mr. Harris. So my, my question I'm reading through this, I, I do think this is for the most part kind of what we talked about. You know, it's, it only make it makes sense for someone who has residential property that that backs up to commercial property or multifamily to be able to build the same type of fence that that a GC would be allowed to to build so long as it's done correctly. Um, so I, I think that part's there. My, my question, uh, Mr. McCord, is the last one on, on D permits required. Um, and Chuck may chime in on this. I think currently permits are not required for fences that are six feet or shorter. Is this recommending that now every time a four foot fence is built in a yard that somebody's going to have to get a building permit for every fence that goes in? Okay, Matt, we require a fence permit for any fence, but uh, most of them are the fence uh, fees are, are waived by the building department until we get to seven feet or, or higher. The okay. uh, planning department requires a fence permit so that we can let them know about easements because if you build a fence in a public uh, utility easement, mm -hmm. it, work has to be done there your fence is going to be taken down and left for you to put back up. And that's why it's a uh, point that we need to let them know if they do that, what, what their, what, what the ramifications are that they could build a fence, a four foot fence in a public utility drainage easement. If work has to be done in that easement, they're going to take that fence down, and leave it laying in your yard for them to put back up. And Mr. Harris, this is Josh King. We've been working very closely with, our, our, our engineering and stormwater team on uh, identifying the difference between just a regular drainage easement and critical drainage easements for that carry uh, more regional versus your individual lot. So we are working to identify these to be able to let homeowners know where it's more likely the city will need to come in and do work versus uh, what you would have with just the traditional lot. So um, I had two, two questions for Mr. Stewart. First of all, I found that really fascinating. I didn't realize just how much more exponentially more susceptible an eight foot fence is to wind shear than a six foot fence. That's, that's really interesting. Um, one question, a shadow box fence be less vulnerable? Um, you know, would it allow the wind to move through better than a solid fence? Well, that's a that's a question, uh, Ms. Beer, that uh, building officials can't answer. That'd be an engineering question. That uh, they'd have to hire an engineer on the fence, to give them spacing and everything to uh, reduce the uh, pressure against that fence from a wind speed. Okay, that's and that kind of leads to the second question: Is would the way this code is written um, prevent situations from Miss Huntsman's? Well, the one specific situation that we had recently that triggered all this, would it prevent that from happening because it would bring it more under your scrutiny, under your purview so that you get to look at it? Because I think there's the biggest problem is that recently a fence was constructed without correct structural uh, engineering taking place. Uh, so I'm just uh, asking, would, would 
help you, Mr. Stewart. Would it be a... Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That fence would require an engineer design. It would, and an engineer had to come out and uh, confirm that the uh, fence posts were at the appropriate depth and, and uh, concrete and the all the uh, fence boarding on that fence, how they were attached. Uh, Ten, ten penny nails don't work. It it takes uh, three. I think the code calls for three screws per board, for uh, per lateral run. There, there's a few things that it requires. The engineer would have to uh, to give us. It's. I'm gonna relate this to a retaining wall. If you have a retaining wall that's less than four feet uh, in height, the code department can approve that. But once it exceeds four feet, there's a surcharge. Uh, on uh, land on the back side of it for unbalanced fill and uh, a sort of thing. So there's not a code inspector that can, that can prove that. It has to be approved by an engineer. Mr. Chairman, I think what you're alluding to is the reason that we are here discussing this item tonight is because of a recent BZA case uh, that was uh, tied to a variance request. <clears throat> and that case uh, started out as a fence that was erected without a permit. We won't know whether someone erects a fence without a permit until it's essentially done. And sometimes it, it'll be a while before we even discover that. We may not discover in some cases that fences are erected without a permit. So uh, that person been uh, following our code or checked with us to about what standards were before they began construction, it's per, quite likely that we could have uh, resolved it at that time. And if they wanted to go to for a variance, then they could, before investing a lot of money in a, in a structure, insured themselves of not falling afoul of this ordinance. And Mr. Chairman, we are working um on different ways of communicating what some of our standards are uh, to the general public, specifically around fences that does imp that impacts uh, a variety of different kind of homeowners. Uh, a lot of a lot of times we are told that the homeowner was not aware that they needed a permit, so we are working on messaging and getting that word out to the public so that they understand a little clearer what the requirements are and that they do indeed need a permit for a fence. And, and Mr. Chairman, let's check again. Uh, prior to uh, the adoption of the 2018 codes, uh, the city of Gotham was operating under the 2019 codes and had no uh, choice but to move. Uh, we had to stay uh, within seven years of the most recently adopted code. So we moved all the way to 18. We gave us seven years before we got to move again. Uh, but the 09 codes that were in effect two years ago only required a permit on a fence that exceeded six feet in height. And when we adopted the new code, it, uh, it changed. I just, well, Mr. Stewart, I just want to make sure that we don't have another BVA case. Obviously, I understand it's kind of a different issue. If that person had been following the uh, uh, the ordinance, they would have gotten a permit. They would have been told that they couldn't build an eight-foot fence. That's if correct. Adjacent, yeah, if they're adjacent to commercial, I understand the need for them to have an eight-foot fence, but I want to make absolutely sure that it falls under your, um, I don't know if supervision is the right word, but um, but you get to check it off and make sure that they followed all the requirements. Are you in favor or opposed to the way this ordinance is, this resolution is written, Mr. Stewart? I'm asking your opinion. Yes, sir. And, and see, uh, you know, you, you guys know my background. I come from Louisiana here. After Hurricane Katrina, the whole roof, everything changed across the country. It was about airborne debris. Uh, it's got like homeowners insurance now is like uh, your liability car insurance. If you hit someone, you're going to fix your car. Well, homeowners insurance is, is following that. So there's a big, there's a lot of things in the code now about airborne debris. If you put a building in your backyard and you don't have it tied down, your storage shed lifts up and smacks the neighbor's house, 
your insurance company's fixing, they're fixing to go after your insurance company to repair their home. And it's about anything that's airborne. That's why fences were brought into this because of the possibility of these fences uh, launching pieces of them into, into neighbors' uh, homes or uh, other buildings there. And that's, that, that really changed our world for us uh, at that time. And it's been a continual change since then. The 12 codes to the 15 codes to the 18 codes. And we're already looking at the 21 codes to see what changes they have. And insurance companies uh, change our world. They do. Mr. Chairman, may I speak? Please, Councilman Fennell. You know, I, I'm trying to think of what I want to say. Um, Bill McCord, uh, did we, I, I don't want, first of all, I don't want to leave Miss Huntsman just flopping in the wind. Uh, I don't know, I, I was under the impression that uh, either the mayor or the council come to some kind of solution for her uh, to finish this fence up. And I know she's waiting on some type of a solution are we at the point where, even though we don't have a permit or anything like that, but Chuck, or I, I know this is a, uh, I think a one-time deal that we hope that will not happen again, but Chuck, is this, are we at the point right now where to try to solve this for Ms. Huntsman, that we need to get somebody from coach to go out there and look and see how this thing's constructed to see if she needs to put screws in it or box the other side uh to try to help this uh this citizen out that that's what that's what i'm asking of you guys what do we need to do to try to help this citizen uh, mr Fennell, i can't make that determination you would have to apply for a fence permit for a fence that's eight feet in height at that point we were required engineer uh to come in there and give us that design that we and that our, our current wind speed uh that we live under and then we would take a look at his design and go take a look at his recommendations uh to see if that fence met the hit the engineer design for that uh, application And council member Fennell. I understand, Fennell, I'm sorry, I, I, I should have said this to you. I understand that my position as building officials, I have to look out for the liability of the city. So if a structure is placed in here, it doesn't meet the current codes adopted and something uh, goes a, a, a wire there that uh, we have a windstorm, we have something that pieces start tearing another building apart, and then I'm going to be questioned along with the mayor and the, and the city council here as to how this happened. So I have to, I have a set of guidelines I have to follow to look out for the liability of the city. Is she able to pull a permit even though the fence is erected and have an in, pay an engineer to look at it and see how it's erected and if it is in compliance? So council member Fennell, this is Josh King again. Uh, the BZA did grant Ms. Huntsman specifically a variance for her fence. And one of the conditions was to install a landscape barrier between the fence and the visible side of the property, which would face. Uh, it's okay. not lo it, uh, so until this item is adopted by council and the zoning ordinance is changed, Ms. Huntsman would have to comply with the approval of the, uh, she would have to comply with the plan that the BZA approved for this property, for her property. Okay, I understand. I understand you also that. have to comply with the building code since it's an eight foot tall fence. So she never got a permit either from the building department or the planning department before she erected the fence. And that's why we have the problem. I think to get to your question earlier is that could the fence that she erected be deemed sufficient both for the planning uh, department's 
requirements as well as in uh, the building code department. And based on what I know of how the fence was constructed and where it was constructed, I would say no. <clears throat> I know that if I had known um, the information that Chuck Stewart has revealed to us tonight about windborne debris, see, I always thought the fence uh, ordinance that we had was strictly an aesthetics thing. I had no idea that it, uh, uh, fence debris uh, created such a danger to neighbors and, and, and the community as a whole, and that's why the fence ordinance is in place. So. I appreciate Mr. Stewart's input, and I keep hammering Mr. Stewart for a question. I want to make sure that nobody builds an eight-foot fence without having to get it, uh, an engineered plan and, and, and follow all of the building code requirements with screws and uh, posts set to the proper depth and be structurally sound against high winds. So, Mr. Stewart, I'll ask you the question again. The way this resolution is written, um, if we were to approve this, does it increase or decrease the liability to the community. Mr. Stewart, I think you're still muted. Thank you. I'm uh I'm contemplating my answer here. Uh I have to go back and read the ordinance again. Uh it would require a building permit. Once a building permit has been applied for, then we can uh, apply the rules of the codes uh, as adopted by the city at that time. And uh, I'm gonna give you a for an instance here. If this fence that's been erected does not meet that code, then it would have to be adjusted. Uh, in other words, let's say that the posts are only two feet in the ground and the code will require them for three and a half feet in the ground and a 10 inch hole of concrete and that had to be that had to be uh, repaired and to an engineer standard. We would accept that engineer's judgment. Uh, code departments do not override design professionals. A professional engineer comes in and says, I, I believe this fence is okay for 115 mile an hour wind zone, then we would accept that, okay? Uh, so the first thing would have to happen on an existing fence that was put in without a permit would be an engineer would have to submit all his data to us for us to review before we issue the permit to approve the permit for the fence. And I hope that answers your question. There to Chuck, I echo what Chairman, per year said, I had no idea about liabilities of fence. It seems like I got a good education on it this evening. And for that, I appreciate it. I think getting back to the, to the ordinance, I don't, you know, I think we have two separate conversations and issues going on. One's about a, a fence that's already built. I don't, you know, that's gotta be dealt with on its own, the, you know, my comments on the ordinance as a whole, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest before today's meeting, I just about lunch day finally had time to start reading through the ordinance and, and looking at it. I do think we need to do something with it. Um, you know, the, the language of the ordinance, I think is as a result from our planning commission or work session conversation a few weeks ago. And it's the first time we've, we've debated or, and talked about the language of this proposed ordinance. So I, uh, I personally would like to research a little bit more and look into it more and, and not make a decision on it this evening, just because we are talking about changing an ordinance the, the first time we've seen the language as a group. So I, if you know, I, I'd be open to just to deferring it to the next meeting if that's possible. Oh, man, I, you took the words out of my mouth. If you'll make a motion to defer, I'll second. Because I'll, I'll make a motion. Like second. We have a second by Ms. Hibbler. All in favor of the motion uh, as stated to defer this item, just one more meeting. Um, and I promise I'll ask questions and research it more. 
Uh, all in favor of the motion to indicate by saying aye in response to a roll call vote. Chair Pereer. Aye. Vice Chair Harris. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Councilman Fennell. Aye. Dr. Orgain. Aye. Mr. Strouther. Aye. Ms. Hibbler. Aye. Uh, passes 7-0. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other um, other, announce other business or announcements? Mr. Perrier, or Mr. Perrier, uh, we were having some previous discussion about the pulling the surety for Tulip Poplar uh, Drive. Uh, if it's, are there any remaining questions for uh, City Engineer Nick Tuttle while he's here? We yeah, I think we I think we decided to, to add that as an item onto the agenda at the end of the meeting, didn't, didn't we? Yes. Okay, so um, so I I, I first, first off, I'm just you know, we talked a lot about the the surety on Tulip Poplar and and all that. So I first off want to just make a a statement too that um, you know my, my comments about the surety in regards to Tulip Poplar it's in no means a negative to, uh, to to Nick and his engineering group. These guys do a fantastic job, and I don't think they've got anything but intentions for the city of Gallatin and and how we're moving through this. So I don't I don't want anything to say to 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 be construed as otherwise. So um however you know so I guess so maybe Nick can you comment on kind of where where we're at with the you know with the, the Tula Poplar Road what's the best path forward and and I think the you said the uh, the folks involved might want to comment or, or or talk to us about that. Sure thing, Mr. Harris. Um, yeah, just just a real quick uh, recap over the past couple of weeks. Uh, you know, just as we said, the the letter of credit for the Baker's Crossing subdivision, um, the Planning Commission passed that resolution uh, back um, a few weeks ago uh, to make a demand on that surety based on the performance of the uh, the letter holder there, um, who is Lampton Bank. Um, at this current time and um, so so we had actually already been in touch with them they tried to speak during the meeting and so uh, they I think they were un, they were unable to really communicate to us during that meeting at that time um, very effectively I don't know if their their um, internet connection was unstable or what the problem was but um, um, I, I tried to carry on some other conversations with those folks um, and, and they've really stepped up to the plate um, and, and having some, some conversations and scheduling some meetings with um, a contractor. And so that's why I, I, I felt like, um, I guess I was, was showing a little mercy there and, um, and grace. And I know that um, it's probably, it may not, may not be deserved to, Fifteen years on the road from the, the original uh, recording of this flat, but um, I guess that that's kind of my nature. I wanted to give uh, just a uh, these. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, I am in full agreement that. Nick, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I guess that those people with microphones are not muted, and I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. If, if everybody else on the call could mute your microphones, I sure would appreciate it, so I can hear hear Nick. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I am, I'm in hundred percent agreement that we need to take action prior to the end of the year. Um, and the, um, the, the letter holder I, I agrees with that. And as a matter of fact, they've communicated to me that they would like to, uh, fully surface this roadway and, um, do that with the month of November. Um, so, um, I, I feel like if they can perform that, um, prior to, or, or make, make some some motion here prior to our next meeting in November which is actually in the middle of November um, I, I would be willing to, to wait um, if the Planning Commission would um, I fully understand if you're not because again I know we have waited for a very long time for this already um, but 
Um, I, I think that we do still have a, a small window of, of opportunity, um, even giving uh, another three weeks um, to allow them to perform. Uh, so um, I, because of the, I guess, the timing of, of the November meeting, I think the November meeting is, is actually on the 16th of November. Uh, so I believe that um, Sheldon Griffin is is the name on the list that um, looks familiar to me. He is he is listed as an attendee, uh, and and I believe he's prepared to speak tonight. And it looks like it actually looks like Marty Cook may have raised his hand, uh, maybe as legal counsel for their their team. Mr. Cook and Mr. Griffin, your lines have been unmuted. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, um, members of the Planning Commission. This is Marty Cook, and I do represent Limestone Bank. Uh, and appreciate Nick's, Nick's comments and him working with us over the last few weeks. I was not on that last uh, call when there were some technical difficulties for the, uh, the representatives of the bank. But this, it really is a timing issue for us as evidenced by some of the earlier discussion as you all know, the bank inherited uh, this th this property. They're not a developer, but they inherited it from a developer back in the recession and have been actively trying to sell the property since then and now have the property under contract. And so the timing issue was that they were unsure whether the approval process would start for their buyer and the road improvements would be included in that process. Um, and, and then the letter of credit came up for renewal um, during that time. And that's when they started some discussions with Nick. Um, and then there was the issue in the, in, in the last meeting where they weren't able to speak. And so it, it's my understanding their representatives have had active discussions with Nick um, up until today uh, and, and have contractors lined up to look at this and get this work done within a matter of weeks. And, and as Mr. McCord said, as with related to the project, and especially in light of the fact that tonight you all have voted to send that PMDP on to city council, you know, there we're a, a, a ways off from any work starting um, on that road. And so if, if we could ask for some, for the grace that uh, Nick has been so kind as to recommend um, to give us, a few weeks to, to get this work done. You know, it was originally the hope by the bank that the buyer would, would kind of take on this responsibility, but now seeing that it's gonna be a little while longer, um, the bank is willing to go ahead and, and do this work that Nick is recommending. And if we just have a few weeks to get that done, uh, then, then they're happy to do that. And, and then hopefully we'll be able to move this on to uh, a, a developer who is really in that business and can uh, get this project done to the satisfaction of the, the this commission and the council. Thank you. Uh, question: So, is it your your client's intention that this would be finished by the end of November? Yes, sir. Okay. Um. um Nick, I. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate your work trying to get this resolved. This has obviously been something that's been dragging on out there for a, for a really long time. And I, I do think it's in the best interest of the city and everyone involved if, if, the, if the, the current surety holder, if these folks can get this road finished. And I, I think in, in consideration of, you know, the weird times that we're living in with COVID holding meetings via Zoom and internet connections, that you know they they clearly weren't able to communicate with us at our previous meeting when we moved forward with that. So I'm I'm not opposed to to giving them till the end of November to to get this fixed and get it resolved. I do think we probably um, this might be a question for our legal counsel since we've already we've already voted to make a demand on the surety. We would probably need to have a vote to undo that decision and give them till the end of November. Would that be correct?
Uh, yes, this is Latisha Alexander. You may want to do that. I do recall during the discussion, you did vote to uh, call both those sureties, but there was discussion from Nick that if he could get an agreement, and I think it was with the two popular people, that you all were okay if he did not call that surety. That was my recollection of that discussion. It was definitely called on both of them, but there was discussion regarding them actually, actually um, act, action on that. Yeah. So you can do it either way. I do know that there was discussion regarding that, but if you want to just um, make a motion to withdraw the calling of the surety, that's not a problem. I think I think that would be clearest way to do it. So there's no further confusion on it. So I'll 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 make a motion that we we withdraw our demand on the surety and extend till November 30th for those repairs to get made. Is that a correct way to state that? That was perfect, Mr. Harris. Thank you. I'll second. I have seconded. Um, was that Mr. Wilson seconded? Yes. This is Bill McCord. Voting. Item. Yes, go ahead. You're rescinding the surety uh, to call um, that item. <clears throat> You're recalling that surety. Um, we're not going to recall it, I should say. <clears throat> So do you want to approve a resolution? Do you want to have to draft a resolution or is it su sufficient in the minutes, I'm asking the attorney this, to simply allow this uh, to transpire via the minutes or do you need a separate resolution to uh, extend the surety until uh, the end of November and if it's not completed by November to call it? Uh, that's the way I read uh, 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 Matt's uh, uh, motion to extend it till the end of uh, November. Okay. Bill, you know, I think you can, I think there needs to be a resolution that is extended, but I think it would have to come back before the Planning Commission to demand it again. You can't just, uh, I don't think you can demand it that way. And I don't know what the practice has been, but I feel like you still have to come like we've extended before and given notice and they've come back before the planning commission before there was an actual demand afterwards. So however you have done it in the past, I'm okay with. So I'll ask a clarifying question then. So if we, you know, we, we can make, we can make a, a vote to withdraw the, the request to make a demand on the surety. And then if we're not seeing action at our mid November meeting, we can then, just make it vote to make a demand on the surety at that point and move on. Could we not? We can have a resolution prepared to call the surety at that time if there's no progress made in uh, getting the road finished. Well, Mr. Wilson, if you'd if you'll, well, I'll make a motion to modify, modify or add an amendment to the motion to remove the, you know, the requirement that it be extended as. Just, just simply that the motion is to withdraw the demand on the surety at this point. Is that clear as mud? Could you repeat that, Mr. Harris? Just, just modifying my motion to remove the November. So my, to clarify, the motion that I, I'm proposing is just to, to withdraw the demand on the surety. Okay, and just take out the November requirement. Yes. Okay. Keep in mind that the reason it was being called is that it was due to be renewed. So you're going to need to renew or modify that resolution to put place an extension date on it. So like you do with each surety, like we did today, we, we heard a resolution under consent to extend sureties for another year or so. So you won't want to identify a date to extend it to. Well, that's what I did in my first motion, I thought. Matt, as I said the first time, your motion was perfect. It right. would 
be demanded, then whatever department head or whoever can bring it back before the Planning Commission, but you are withdrawing and extending till November the 30th. Okay. I, you know what, for the, for the sake of being done this evening, I, my, the, since actually since Mr. Wilson didn't rescind his second to my original motion, that one would still be technically on the floor. So I'll restate my motion that I would like a vote on, which is that we withdraw our request to make a demand on this surety and extend it till November the 30th. Second. And I still second. Okay. Attorney's giving me the rare blessing that the motion was stated perfectly, so I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can hear me. I, I've lost the video. I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Motion on the floor in a second. Um, all in favor, respond to the roll call vote and indicate by saying aye. Chair Pereer. Aye. Vice Chair Harris? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Uh, Councilman Fennell? Councilman Fennell? Dr. Orgain? Aye. Uh, Mr. Strouther? Aye. Uh, Ms. Hibbler? Aye. Uh, uh, you have, a, it passes 6 0. All right, thank you. Are there any other announcements or any other business? Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is Josh King. There's uh, several items happening in the next couple of weeks. The first is that the work session for the Planning Commission is Monday, November 2nd, which if you have a calendar in front of you is seven days from now. We have a total of four agenda items, so cross your fingers, we'll be able to get through it fairly quickly. There is a, sponsored by the Tennessee American Planning Association, a four-hour training available on uh, Friday, November 13th, and that's from 8 to 12. I'll send out a reminder email. If you would like to join us in person, we'll be hosting a uh, viewing here in the city council chambers. Uh, we do ask that you wear a mask. The, all, there, you can also view that training from the comfort of your own home or office and we will send you the information that you can register. It is free of charge. The Planning Commission meeting will be Monday, November 16th at 5 p.m. We do have uh, Jenny Salaji. We had to reschedule her from October. She has uh, agreed to present to us about architecture and regulating architectural design at the end of the Planning Commission meeting uh, on the 16th. On Wednesday, November 18th, this one is new. Uh, we are going to host a joint city council planning commission event via Zoom. We're going to discuss uh, plan Gallatin and some specific methodology in which um, we're introducing to both this board and the city council about how we intend to regulate, uh, how we intend to establish land uses and a couple of other ideas and that's going to be on the 18th at 5 p.m via zoom there'll be more information coming out on that shortly um, staff is putting together that presentation and um, some materials for that meeting and that'll be wednesday november 18th at 5 p.m you'll be receiving uh, more emails and more information we also have to make sure that, that he receives notice in the paper because it is going to be a joint city council planning commission event. Uh, no items will be discussed, but no development projects will be discussed, but the way that we view and characterize development will be discussed uh, as it relates to Plan Gallatin. Uh, so that is all that I have. Bill, if there's anything you'd like to add, no, I think that covers it. Uh, Mr. Pereira, can I just ask Mr. Tuttle a question about that surety? Um, does the Home Depot surety, is that included in that Baker's Crossing? Is that both, the, did we discuss them both the same time or is that something we're not discussing tonight? 
Mary Ann, I was, I was hoping to bring that up as well. And no, uh, it's not my understanding that the Home Depot surety was covered in the Boston surety. It's its own surety standing alone. And um, I, I don't know if it's appropriate. Um, I'll, I'll wait for Mr. Harris or for you here to recognize me to, to speak on that. Well, I, yeah, for, for clarity, no, my, my motion was not in reference to the Home Depot surety. Those are two different sureties. So your, your interpretation is correct, Nick, on that. So, um, John, do we, uh, no, can we, uh, can we recognize, uh, Nick to speak about the Home Depot surety? Oh, absolutely. Go ahead, Nick. So I do believe that um, we have an attendee, Randall. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his last name. I'm going to try with Lu Juan. Um And he is um, legal counsel for um, the Home Depot letter of credit. Um, I have had um, a phone conversation uh, last week and exchanged several emails with those folks last week. But um, they, they too, um, have asked um, to, for, for us to reconsider our, our action. Um, I haven't had the same kind of conversations that I've had with the Home Depot letter of credit owner that I did with the Baker's Crossing, whereas we discussed um, actually going out and, and making improvements. They were just begging to be heard at this agenda. And so um, I, I uh, since we had not um, received um, word back from the, the lender, um, they said that they were actually going to take action on our request today. So I asked them if they could at least postpone it today uh, so that they could um, be heard here tonight. And um, again, I think Randall is, is on the line here still. So um, if, if you are willing to allow him to speak, then um, I believe he's available. Uh, yes, go ahead, Randall. Oh, sorry, what are you doing? oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. This is uh, this is Randall Lejewan, um with Troutman Sanders. I'm uh, outside legal counsel for Home Depot, and uh, yeah, uh, as, as as Nick described, um, I'm not sure if there's any sort of notices, and there there may have been or so, some sort of attempts to reach out to Home Depot, but uh, as you can imagine, Home Depot is a a, a big place, and there's a, there's a lot of uh, places where things go and hide. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I believe Home Depot found out last week from its lender that the uh, letter of credit was going to be drawn upon. And I, w I, I received a call on late Friday afternoon uh, asking to just to look into the history of it. And as you may know, uh, Home Depot sold this property back in 2017. Um, they, Home Depot is aware of the the, the um, ongoing obligation to to uh, to complete that the the construction of the roadway and 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 I guess I'm just here to uh, to to ask for a little bit more time. I I have a call scheduled tomorrow with one of uh, Home Depot's outside uh, site development coordinators just to get him up to speed for him to take a look at, uh, into it. And I, I I believe Home Depot would like to have a chance to to. To, to do the construction actually. Um, but, but what I'm just asking for is just, just for a little bit more time for, uh, for Home Depot to get up to speed and, and, um, and just get a little bit more, more knowledge on, on the issues. Hey, Nick, question for you, sir. The, uh, where how do we know or what's what where do the notices get sent that sureties need to be renewed or or that the time's up how's that how does that process work mr harris i send out those notices and okay. they were sent to um the bank and at the same time they were sent to terry algera if i'm pronouncing it correctly from home depot and to mr uh Lijuan also copies were sent to both those people the same time they were sent to the bank yeah i i actually did not receive a copy i, I changed firms a few years back so i think okay. I, I assume it went back to my my old firm right. 
I just had that's the only address I had. Yeah, I did notice that Randall's email address was different when he was communicating with me um, Friday and over the weekend. But, but, I mean, but so what about the notices that went to Home Depot? Were those to the right place? Uh, they were sent to a Terry, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, but when I spoke to Miss Straw, she said that she was going to check with Terry. So I'm not sure what happened there, but um, that's what was sent to. That's the contact that we had, the last contact that we had. And it, it, Home Depot did not really, has not communicated with us in quite a while. So that's the last contact we had. Okay. And it may have been the, the notice may have gone to their, um, their office and their, uh, their offices in Atlanta or um, everyone's working from home or a, a, a good percentage of people are working from home. So maybe sitting on someone's desk uh, or in, in, in the mail room. Gotcha. Um, Nick, question for you, sir. The, um, I think we were talking about the surety on the on the Home Depot portion of the road that helped my memory if I'm wrong, but that there was probably more money available to be drawn on the letter of credit than it would take to get that fixed. Is that is my memory close to right on that? Yes, sir. That's correct. I, well, I don't. I think it would cost less than half of what's available there to be the in the paving. It's only a, a couple of hundred feet of, of roadway. And what happens to, you know, so if we make a, if, if you get the, uh, the money from the letter of credit and there's you know, money left over after the city finishes the work and gets it done, what happens to the balance of the money? Well, Latisha may want to weigh in. Um, as I understand it, we, we should uh, document our expenses. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure if we're required to return the remainder. Um, or, or if we can utilize the remainder to go towards future maintenance expenses for that particular road. Uh, um, it's not something that we've done too often. Okay. Uh, the way the way it's written, it's required to be returned. We can only use the money that is needed for the, for what the, we can only use the money that's needed that we got the surety for. So we would have to return the remainder. Okay, that, that was my understanding, and that would that would that would make sense. So, um, anyway, I, 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 you know, if 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 the city was going to get twice the amount of money that it would take to finish these improvements and get the get the project corrected, and not give it back to the folks at Home Depot, that would not you know appeal to my sense of fair play. But you know, sixteen years, however long this has gone on, I. I think we need to stand by our decision, get this road finished quickly. So, and then, you know, whatever's left over, they'll get the, the balance back. And I don't think the city of Gallatin's engineering and public works departments are in the business of, of overspending on things. So that's just my opinion. I, I second Mr. Harris's opinion. It wasn't a motion, but I'm just seconding the opinion. Um, no, motion. Uh, Sorry. No, go ahead, Mr. Harris. Anybody else? Would somebody else weigh in on this? I wish there was a way to give uh, uh, this gentleman on the line, uh, you know, 72 hours to to, to reach somebody, but I don't want to extend this again to uh, December 31st and, and have yet another vote on whether or not we call this surety. I, I agree. We have a we have a path forward with the with the other piece of this particular road. So we keep in mind this is this is the last the last part of the uh, the Trolla Poplar Road that we just finished talking about. So you know. I think we've got some direction that by the end of November that road's going to be finished and in good shape and I don't think we need to go past that.
So, so for well, clarity, do we need to make a motion on anything, or are we just? I mean, uh, this is this has already been called, so I don't know that there's anything for us to do unless I'm mistaken. Unless you're going to withdraw your previous uh, demand, there is nothing to do on this. Okay. Then I'll just ask, does anyone have anything to add? Does anyone have any comments they wish to make in regards to this? No. And I don't think any action is necessary. Is there any um, other announcements or other business? Uh, Mr. Pereer, would, you know, and I don't know the procedure on it if we would need to suspend rules, but um, since Mr. Fennell was not here for our conversation on the, the apartments and the major or minor, Amendment. Would there be any interest in revisiting that briefly and letting him, let him contribute to that conversation since he wasn't able to join us earlier? Mr. Harris, uh, Mr. Fennell is no longer on the line, but he, uh, he will have the opportunity to weigh in as a member of City Council. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Harris, okay. I think because we closed that item, I don't think I can open it back up. Fair enough. Uh, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. How did that vote? I, I've lost track here. Did the vote go to make it a minor or a major on the apartments at uh, Baker's Crossing? Uh, we decided to make it a major uh, and we sent it to City Council with a recommendation for approval, but we sent it to Council as a recommendation as a, a major. So it has to go before Council. Okay, I missed in my notes here. What was the uh, reason that uh, it went to a major, if you don't mind me asking? Certainly. Uh, there were three reasons, if I can state them accurately. And it was, uh, condition number one, which is a change in density. Uh, number two was changes in architecture. And number three was changes in site and grading plan. Thank you. I hope I'm stating the third one correctly. If there are no, Josh, Bill, staff, or if there are no other announcements, um, then we'll adjourn. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting and we don't have to vote. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. I'll, okay, very good. Um, I think it's safe to say we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.